In this chapter, we'll review Chapter 39, The Nixon Administration. Nixon was inaugurated on January 20th, 1969, and he was a conciliator of, of the clashing forces that were ripping American society apart. He was solitary and suspicious, brittle and testy in the face of opposition, and bitterly resented the liberal establishment. Yet he brought one huge valuable asset to the White House, and that was his broad knowledge and thoughtful expertise in foreign affairs, and he applied himself to put America's foreign policy in order. His first goal was to quiet the uproar over Vietnam. In his Vietnamization policy, he wanted to withdraw the 540,000 troops in South Vietnam over an extended period. The southern Vietnamese, with U.S. money, weapons, training, and advice, would gradually take over the war. This evolved into the Nixon Doctrine, which proclaimed that the United States would honor its existing defense commitments, but in the future, allies would have to fight their own wars without support of large U.S. bodies of troops. Nixon sought to win the Vietnam War by other means, without further spilling American blood. He advocated immediate withdrawal, and the anti-protesters, who were also advocating immediate withdrawal, staged a big national Vietnam moratorium in October 1969. Nixon launched a counteroffensive by appealing to the silent majority who presumably supported the war. His appeal was deeply divisive. Spiro Agnew, the vice president, was attacked or attacked the nattering naboobs of negativism who demanded a quick end to the war. And in 1970, Nixon sneered at the student protesters as bums. By January 1970, Vietnam had become very unpopular even among the U.S. troops in the field. The armed forces in Vietnam were largely composed of the least privileged young Americans. Early in the war, African Americans were disproportionately represented in the Army, and they accounted for the highest share of combat fatalities. U.S. soldiers fought the Vietnamese as well as booby-trapped swamps and steaming jungles. Unable to tell friend from foe among the peasants, they turned to drug abuse, mutiny, and sabotage, which dulled their fighting edge. Their morale plummeted further with rumors that the soldiers fragged their officers, murdering them with fragmented gr grenades. And revelations in 1970 about the 1968 slaughter in My Lai deepened the domestic disgust with the war. Vietnam vets protest the war in 1971 on the steps of the Capitol building. On April 29, 1970, Nixon, without consulting Congress, ordered U.S. troops to clean out the enemy sanctuaries in officially neutral Cambodia. Massive campus riots took place over this newest ex escalation. At Kent State University in Ohio, the jumpy National Guard fired into a noisy crowd, killing four and wounding many more. At a historically black Jackson State College in Mississippi, highway patrol officers discharged volleys, killing two students. This is a picture uh, titled The War at Home, Spring of 1970, showing the incident at Kent State University in Ohio when National Guardsmen were sh basically shot into a crowd of demonstrators. Nixon withdrew troops from Cambodia on June 29, 1970, after only two months. The results of the Cambodian invasion were that it amplified bitterness between the hawks and the doves in the United States. It increased disillusionment with Whitey's war and increased um, this feeling among African Americans in the armed forces. The Senate, but not the House, repealed the Gu Gulf of Tonkin blank check that Congress had given Johnson in 1964. And youth only slightly mollified when the government reduced draft calls and shortened the period of draftability on a lottery basis from eight years to one year. The youth were pleased, though not pacified, in 1971 when the 26th Amendment lowered the voting age to 18. New combustibles fueled the fires of anti-war discontent in June of 1971. The former Pentagon official, a former Pentagon official leaked to the New York Times the Pentagon Papers, which was a top-secret Pentagon study that documented the war's blunders and deceptions, especially provoking of the 1964 North Vietnamese attack on the Gulf of Tonkin. Nixon's detente with Beijing, Peking, and Moscow. There were dramatic initiatives also in Nixon's presidency in Beijing and Moscow. 
two major communist powers clashed over the interpretation of Marxism as well as the border between them. Nixon realized the Chinese-Soviet tension afforded the United States the opportunity to play one antagonist against the other, and enlisting aid of both of them, he enlisted aid in both of them in pressuring the North Vietnamese towards peace. Henry Kissinger had been meeting secretly with the North Vietnamese officials in Paris to negotiate the end of the war, and he was meanwhile preparing the president's path to Beijing and to Moscow. In July of 1971, Nixon announced that he had accepted an invitation to visit Communist China the following year, and he made his historic journey in February of 1972. He capped his visit with the Shanghai Communique, in which the two nations agreed to normalize their relationship. This was an important part of the accord, and another important part of the accord was America's acceptance of the One China policy, which implied a lessened American commitment to the independence of Taiwan. Nixon next, next traveled to Moscow in May of 1972 to play the China card in the game of high-stakes diplomacy with the Kremlin. The Soviets seemed ready to deal with the United States. So Nixon's visit ushered in an era of what's called detente, which means relaxed tension with the major communist powers. And it produced several significant agreements in 1972. Most importantly, the U.S. and the Soviet Union agreed to anti-ballistic missile treaty the ABM Treaty, and to a series of arms reduction negotiations known as SALT, which stands for Strategic Arms Limitation Talks. These were aimed at freezing the numbers of long-range missiles for five years. ABM and SALT Accords were a first step towards slowing the arms race, yet they both forged ahead with the development of MIRVs, which were multiple independently targeted reentry vehicles, which put a number of warheads on a single missile. So Nixon's detente diplomacy did, to some extent, de-ice the Cold War. Nixon remained staunchly anti-communist, and he opposed the election of the Mar Marxist Salvador Allende to the president of Chile in 1970. Allende died during an army attack on his headquarters in 1973, and Nixon warmly embraced Allende's successor, military dictator General Augusto Pinchot. This picture is titled Dinner Diplomacy, showing President Nixon eating with the Chinese premier and the leader of the Shanghai Communist Party. Nixon was the first president to ever visit mainland China while in office, and his pursuit of normal diplomatic relations with the ruling communist regime ended 23 years of formalized hostility between the United States and the People's Republic. Nixon and the Supreme Court are also notable during this time period. In 1968, Nixon lashed out against the permissiveness and judicial activism of Earl Warren's Supreme Court. The Warren Court had affected sexual freedom, criminal rights, the practice of religion, civil rights, and representation. Notable court cases are Griswold v. Connecticut, 1965, where the court voided a state law that banned the use of contraceptives even among married couples couples because of the right to privacy. And in Gideon v. Wainwright in 1963, the court had held that all criminal defendants were entitled to legal counsel, even if they were too poor to afford it. In Escobedo, 1964, and the Miranda case in 1966, these cases ensured the right of the accused to remain silent and to enjoy protections. This is the root of the Miranda warning, where now police must now read this warning to suspects. The ruling sought to prevent abusive police tactics. To conservatives, they seem to coddle criminals and to subvert law and order. This is still a very big issue in our, in our society today. Conservatives also objected to the court's views on religion. In the court case Engel v. Vitale in 1962 and School District of Abington Township v. Shemp, the justices argued that the First Amendment's separation of church and state meant public schools could not require prayer or Bible reading. Social conservatives raised a new battle cry to impeach Earl Warren as a result. From 1954, the court came under relentless criticism, which was the bitterest since the New Deal days, and they grappled with the problems that legislatures failed to address. <laughs>
Fulfilling the campaign promise, Nixon tried to change the court's philosophical complexion. He sought appointees who would strictly interpret the Constitution, cease in meddling in social and political questions, and not coddle radicals or criminals. He appointed Earl Warren E. Berger to succeed Earl Warren. And before the end of 1971, Nixon had appointed four conservatives to the court. Nixon learned that once seated, justices decide according to conscience, not according to the president's expectations. The Berger court proved reluctant to dismantle the liberal rulings of the Warren court. Controversial and The controversial and momentous case, Roe v. Wade, in 1973, legalized abortion. This is um, basically a um, conservative point of view propaganda saying that in order to save our republic, we have to impeach Earl Warren for his um, court decisions when he was Chief Justice of the Supreme Court. Nixon, on the home front, oversaw a big expansion of welfare programs that conservative Republicans denounced. He increased appropriations for food stamps, Medicaid, and aid to families with dependent children. He added a new program called Supplemental Security Income to assist aged, the aged, blind, and disabled. He also um, put into effect automatic Social Security cost of living increases. And he implemented the so-called Philadelphia Plan in 1969, which required trade unions to establish goals and timetables for hiring black apprentices. In the Philadelphia plan, this required thousands of employers to meet hiring quotas or establish set-asides for minority subcontractors. This altered the meaning of affirm affirmative action, from protecting individuals against discrimination to a program that conferred privileges on certain groups. The Supreme Court went along with Nixon's approach. In the court case Griggs v. Duke Power Company in 1971, the court banned intelligence tests and other devices that had the effect of excluding minorities or women from certain jobs. The only sure protection against the charge of discrimination was to hire minorities or admit minority students in proportion to their presence in the population. Nixon and the court opened new employment and educational opportunities for both minorities and women, and critics protested these changes as reverse discrimination. Another Nixon legacy was the 1970 creation of the Environmental Protection Agency. Rachel Carson's Silent Spring in 1962 had exposed the poisonous effect of pesticides, and she is sometimes called the mother of the modern conservation movement. On April 22, 1970, millions around the world celebrated the first Earth Day to raise awareness and to encourage leaders to act. Congress passed the Clean Air Act in 1970 and the Endangered Species Act in 1973. The EPA made progress in reducing automobile emissions and cleaning up befouled waterways and toxic waste sites. The federal government expanded the regulatory reach on behalf of workers and consumers as well by signing the Occupational Safety and Health Administration, or OSHA, into law in 1970. This created an agency dedicated to improving working conditions, preventing work-related accidents and death, and issuing safety standards. The Consumer Product Safety Commission was also created, which held companies accountable for selling dangerous products. Business critics decried the nanny state. In 1971, Nixon imposed a 90-day wage and price freeze. He then took the United States off the gold standard and devalued the dollar. These two actions ended the Bretton Woods system of international currency stabilization that had functioned since the end of World War II. He devised a plan called the Southern Strategy to gain re-election in 1972. He appointed conservatives to the uh, Supreme Court. He soft-pedaled civil rights, and he opposed school busing to achieve racial balance. His goal was to convert the disillusioned white Southern Democrats to Republicans. He set in motion sweeping political realignments that eventually transformed the party system. Four years since Nixon promised to end the Vietnam War and win the peace in 1972, North Vietnam burst through the demilitarized zone, separating the two Vietnams, and Nixon launched a massive bombing attack. He was continuing the Vietnam conflict 
and this spurred the rise of the South Dakota Senator George McGovern to 1972's Democratic nomination. He was also helped by changes in the nomination system that increased the importance of primary elections. This new system emphasized media politicking and the activist base. McGovern used the new populist process to campaign in the election of 1972. He promised to pull the remaining troops out of Vietnam in 90 days, which earned him the backing of large anti-war elements in the party. And he appealed to racial minorities, feminists, leftists, and the youth that were alienated, uh, that were alienating traditional working class Democrats. Nixon emphasized that he had wound down the Democratic war in Vietnam from 540,000 to about 30,000 troops. His candidacy received an added boost 12 days before the election when Kissinger announced that peace was at hand and an agreement would be reached in a few days. Nixon won the election of 1972 in a landslide, winning every state except Massachusetts and the non-state of District of Columbia. He received 520 electoral votes to only 17 for McGovern and won the popular majority in a landslide. McGovern counted on the young vote, but less than half of the 18 to 20 age group even bothered to register to vote. This shows European attacks on the Vietnam War proving that the Vietnam War and America's involvement was extremely unpopular abroad. The dove of peace was at hand just before the balloting, and it took flight after the election. Nixon launched a furious two-week bombing campaign, and North Vietnam agreed to a ceasefire in the Treaty of Paris in January of 1973, nearly three months after the peace was prematurely uh, proclaimed. Nixon was hailed or hailed the ceasefire as a peace with honor, but this boast rang hollow as the peace was little more than a U.S. retreat. The United States would withdraw its remaining 27,000 troops and reclaim 560 American prisoners of war, and North Vietnam was allowed to keep 145,000 troops in South Vietnam. The constitutionality of the U.S. war in Cambodia was also an issue during this time period in July 1973 when the public learned that the Air Force had secretly bombed Cambodia 3,500 times since March of 1969. While these forays were going on, U.S. officials, including Nixon, had sworn that Cambodian neutrality was being respected. This defiance followed the secretiveness. Nixon continued the bombing Cambodia even after the Vietnamese ceasefire, and he repeatedly vetoed congressional efforts to stop the bombing. After years of bombing um, wounded Cambodia, it blasted its people, shredded its economy, and revolutionized its politics. Cambodians suffered at the sadistic heel of Pol Pot, where two million died, and Pol Pot was forced from office by 1978 by the Vietnamese invasion. In the 1973 War Powers Act over Nixon's veto, this act required the president report to Congress within 48 hours after committing troops to a foreign conflict or substantially enlarging combat units abroad. Such a limited authorization would end within 60 days unless extended by Congress for 30 days. This act manifested the new isolationism mood of caution and restraint abroad, and the draft ended in January of 1973. Future members of the armed forces would be volunteers. Yom, the Yom Kippur War erupted in October of 1973 when Syria and Egypt attacked Israel to regain land lost during the Six-Day War in 1967. Kissinger flew to Moscow to restrain the Soviets who were arming the attackers. Nixon placed nuclear forces on alert and ordered an airlift of $2 billion in war materials to Israel. The Israelis turned the tide and threatened Cairo before the United States brokered an uneasy ceasefire. This picture is titled, The U.S. Economy Runs Out of Gas, showing the oil crises of the 1970s, which provoked steep price hikes, patient testing lines, and aggressive gas rationing, as depicted here in a Connecticut station. I, as a child, can remember sitting in these gas lines 
and going on either an odd day or an even day to get gas, depending on the last number of your license plate. The U.S. policy of backing Israel against its oil-rich neighbors extracted a heavy penalty. In October 1973, OPEC announced an oil embargo on the United States and those European allies that supported Israel. The oil-rich Arab states also cut their oil production, and this shortage triggered a major economic recession, not only in the United States, but also for France and Britain. An increasingly globalized, interconnected world, all the nations felt the crunch of this energy crisis. This is a picture, a political cartoon titled Oil Shock, that represents when OPEC dramatically jacked up oil prices in the 1970s. Um, many Americans, as represented by the Henry Kissinger figure in this cartoon, were slow to realize that an era of low energy prices had ended forever. Five months of the embargo ended an era of cheap and abundant energy. And since 1948, the United States has been, had been the net oil importer. U.S. oil production peaked in the 1970s and then declined, yet Americans tripled their oil usage since World War II. Automobiles increased 250% between 1949 and 1972. So by 1974, the American, Americans were oil addicted and vulnerable to any interruption in supplies, and the Middle East attained a new importance in U.S. interests. OPEC quadrupled the price for crude oil after lifting the embargo in 1974, and the results were the huge oil bills disrupted the U.S. balance of international trade and further fueled the raging fire of inflation. The U.S. also took the lead to form the International Energy Agency in 1974 as a counterweight to OPEC. The various sectors of the U.S. economy, including automobiles, began to adjust to a dawning age of energy dependency. For example, the national speed limit of 55 was set to conserve fuel. Watergate led to the unmaking of Richard Nixon. The Watergate scandal happened as a result of June 17, 1972, when five men were arrested in the Watergate apartment office complex in Washington. They had planned to plant electronic bugs in the Democratic Party's headquarters, and it soon was revealed that they worked for the Republican Committee to re-elect the president, which was also called Creep. Nixon's administration's dirty tricks were at hand. The Watergate break-in was one of them. It forged documents also to discredit Democrats, and it used the Internal Revenue Service to harass innocent citizens named on the White House enemies list. This is a political cartoon showing Nixon and the law and order man. He burglarized offices of psychiatrists who treated the leaker of the Pentagon Papers and perverted the FBI and CIA to cover the trickster's tracks. Spiro Agnew was forced to resign as a result in October of 1973 for taking bribes from contractors while governor and while vice president. As the investigations began, Nixon denied any prior knowledge of the break-in and any involvement in legal proceedings against the burglars. The former White House aide, a former White House aide, revealed a secret taping system had recorded most of Nixon's conversations, and Nixon agreed to release relevant portions of these tapes. On July 24, 1974, the Supreme Court unanimously ruled executive privilege gave Nixon no right to withhold evidence, and Nixon re reluctantly complied. Three subpoenaed tapes of Nixon's conversations with chief aides on June 23, 1972, proved fatal. As it was called the smoking gun tape, this tape revealed Nixon giving orders six days after the Watergate break-in to use the CIA to hold back an inquiry by the FBI. Nixon's own words on tape convicted him of being involved. The House Judiciary Committee drew up articles of impeachment based on obstruction of justice, abuse of presidential power, and contempt of Congress. This is a political cartoon titled The Smoking Pistol Exhibit A, illustrating the tape recording conversations between Nixon and his top aide on June 23, 1972, that damaged Nixon's claim that he had played no role in the Watergate cover-up. Public wrath proved to be overwhelming. 
Republican leaders in Congress concluded that he was guilty and informed Nixon of his impeachment by full House and removal by Senate were foregone conclusions, and he would do best to resign. Nixon announced his resignation in dramatic television in a dramatic television appearance on August 8, 1974. The nation survived the wrenching constitutional crisis, and could this confirmed that the impeachment machinery forged by the founding fathers could serve its purpose when the public demanded. The principles were that no person is above the law and that the presidents must be held accountable for their actions, and this was strengthened. The United States cleaned its own sullied house. This was an impressive demonstration of self-discipline and self-government to the rest of the world. Watergate weakened the public's faith in government, and economic problems further were deepened by this disillusionment.